the the reason the Sufis are using using these examples from science is the same reason that spiritual people today are using the cosmology today to explain their experiences. Because human beings, they need um, to visualize. They need to be able to reach outside of what they know and use something as a guide for that, you see? So, um, that's why in uh, uh, Arabic, Rahab uh, Chan, uh, don't they say, Al Majazu Khataratul Hakikat? What does this mean? It's the best way to get to the truth. Yeah. So, Al Majazu Khataratul Hakikat. The bridge of the Majaz. Yeah. Is a Khatara. A bridge, a bridge to that. the true reality, to the true reality, you see. So the people cannot simply get to the true reality. They need some examples. So maybe the Sufi would be like the person who has a student who sees double. And he says, it's hot, go and get me the water in the basement. The student goes down to the basement, comes back and says, Oh, your your presence. Um, I notice there are two jugs down there. Which one do you want me to bring? He says, "Take a stone and break one of them and bring me the other one." Because he knows that this will be like a tikkun. What's a tikkun? It means like a blow. The person might wake up from this. You see, so he knows that he'll break both of them if he breaks one of them. You see, so why are we spending so much time on these things? Is because. Um, uh, you you don't just need um, the desire to go to Mecca. You need a horse, a car, an airplane to go to Mecca. You see? These are like a horse, a vehicle, a way to, you, you understand it, you build your emotion around it, you, you have a symbol, we say in English, huh? symbol for the journey, a symbol, and you're using the symbol. And it permeates your your consciousness. You become absorbed in this symbol. So earlier we were talking about knots, huh? and I was explaining the same thing. This is a symbol. Who is using it? All of the Sufis they are using it. What about God? Is he using it? Is he using symbols in Quran? Yes. Yeah. And he says, he says, I will use anything, even if it is as insignificant as a gnat, meaning a small fly. Huh? He says, I have no uh, reluctance to use even some small thing to, to guide us. We're looking at the, the last time, uh, again, I was talking about these scientific representations of reality of the universe and how it may very well be that they don't survive the time. But the Ptolemaic cosmos, it's still the, the reason we, we have to mention this is because we're reading from we're reading from Shabastari, as you recall, and he is making the assumption uh, that that many people they are accepting this view of the universe. It's a little bit like an onion, and in fact, uh, they often describe it when they're when the writers like Lahiji is trying to describe to people. They said, consider it's like an onion with layers. And you have the earth at the center, and, and then so the, the normal one is there's eight spheres. So as we continue to read, if you read my translation of Garden of Mystery, so I had to study this quite a bit because it seemed like a crazy worldview, but it was very current in the Western world and in the Eastern world, this Ptolemaic universe. And, uh, and, and where we got last time, as you recall, we were, we had reached... Uh, the line where he says, um, why was it named the throne of the merciful? What relation has it to the human heart? And you may recall in the commentary, which these days I'm not doing so much of written translation. So we have the video and we've received um, 
several letters. I know I've received some separately. That people prefer the video. It's it's a little bit less work for me. It's a little bit more work for Abiraim John because he has to edit through it. But the the one the one um, lack of the system is that uh, there's not like a written reference, except that uh, I will post the Persian. And then if I've already translated sections, I will post them. And then, of course, if you have either my translation or other translations of the Garden of Mystery, you can, you can use those. But just bear in mind, he's, he's, um, uh, it appears to these people that there, there is a cosmos and the earth is at the center. And the earth, um, is it any less at the center like when in terms of uh, when the astronauts first went to the moon and they sent photographs, images of the earth back to the humans on the earth, <clears throat> didn't that become like a huge inspiration for people? Didn't it become like the reason to move ahead with the environmental movement? Isn't it still the symbol of of this beautiful jewel of a planet, huh? So it's in, in the minds of human beings, it certainly has a special and sacred place. And for these people, they didn't see the earth outside the way that they did. Some of them, not all of them, knew that it was a sphere. Not all of them knew it was a sphere. Uh, are there any people today who believe that it is not a sphere, that it is flat? Is there anybody who believes it's flat? There seem to be. Yes. <laughs> are they are they from uh, are they religious people or are they kooks or what are they? They're 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 kooks. They're kooks. I guess. <laughs> they're they're, they're a group in England actually. They're working very hard to prove that our current methods of scientific exploration are all fabricated and the Earth is actually flat. Yeah. So you have that. And are there any religious people who, for on textual grounds? Uh, they have stood firm that the earth is flat. Is there anybody on, because of their religious beliefs based on, on the, the uh, literature that they're reading, is there anybody who for that reason believes the earth is flat? Probably. Yeah, anybody in Islam who believes the earth is flat? Yeah, there's, there's uh, the, you can read uh, about the, very recently, the greatest uh, religious authorities uh, at Mecca. Um, they they sent issued fatwas that the earth is flat. Anybody who believes it is not flat is a heretic. Uh, you can just Google it. You can see. You can see the guy's name. I remember it was in the newspaper about five years ago, but you can read about it yourself. So the problem is when reality overtakes the world view. I, as you know, I value these things very much that are in the Quran because. Um, they help us to separate, they help us to understand. God has already said, I will give you many symbols. I will give you symbols, and, and I, and this is a Quran uh, uh, brought to you in the Arabic language. Because Why? Because you speak Arabic. You know, I'm not going to bring, uh, I'm not going to reveal the Quran in the Arabic language to the, the um, Miwok tribe of California. You know, I'm going to reveal the, the, Arabic Quran to the people of Mecca who speak Arabic, and that's where the Prophet, peace be upon him, is living, you see. So it's, it, the, the Quran is very contextual, and there are absolute meanings in it, absolute. We, we can find out what God is like to the best of our... God will take us to the threshold where we no longer need words, and therefore, even as he's using words, he wishes to free us from anything that would prevent us from knowing him. So in fact, in the Quran, you have places where there's a flat earth. You have places where there's clearly more of a spherical view. It actually is not one view. And I think that um, those of us who are Muslim and we treasure the Quran, we should say, well, this was done for some wise purpose. This was done for a wise purpose, which is that God is teaching us through examples and metaphors 
And some things are absolute. So if God says, I am Basir, or I am Rahman, we have no way to judge that whatsoever. But if God says, um, through the mouth of one of the prophets that this flat earth or this round earth or even God himself is using the assumptions of a community then then God knows in his wisdom that they will understand you see so uh, uh, and he will therefore forgive them uh, you see so uh, God will guide whoever he wishes to his light and he will give many metaphors, similitudes, many likenesses for the sake of guiding them. He will give them to the, to the people, you see. So, so when, when we should never be upset if um, a modern scientist says, oh, this is not possible, we should never, this should never worry us because it's not, it's, not, it's not our concern, nor was it God's concern. His concern was to get people to where they could uh, arrive at a place where they could transcend the language itself. They could transcend, because God is not trapped in the language, is not trapped in the metaphor. Al Majazu Kantaratul Hakikat. He says the Majaz is we could add an only there. The metaphorical is only a bridge to the real. Now a bridge is not something that you you come to the bridge and you stop there and you start doing sajda to the bridge. No. The bridge is something you come to and you walk across it, right? You only you only need the bridge to get over the other side. You don't need the bridge. You're not going to live on the bridge, usually. You're going to cross the bridge to get to the other side. So that's this very famous uh, Arabic uh, statement, huh? Al-Majazu, the, the metaphorical, is, is the bridge towards the true reality. So when we, we hear the Sufis using this language to the, the even the uh, religious people today, they object to the Sufis using the Ptolemaic spheres, for example. I've read, you can read yourself the critiques of this viewpoint and the, you know, the criticism that going back, of course, a lot of it to Ibn Arabi and Fasi and his gang and, and Ibn Taymiyyah, they're, they're insulted by this, this use. Uh, furthermore, as I've explained to you, the Sufis uh, were among the foremost scientists, because when we talked about uh, like Ibn Sina, um, religious people criticize Ibn Sina as being a mere philosopher. Even some of the Sufis, like Al Ghazali, criticize him. And yet, don't forget, Ibn Sina has written a lot of beautiful mystical treatises. I don't know if any of you have read them. They're very beautiful. He writes the first. Uh, he writes the first Mantikul Tayr. Ibn Sina writes the first book about the birds making the spiritual journey. And Attar relies upon him, Surah Wadi Maktul relies upon Ibn Sina's predecessor to that lovely book about the birds. He's a very, very knowledgeable person. Some people, they have more mind and more intellect, and they're writing about uh, the, the cosmos and the stars and so forth. And some of them, they are more the Saiba Jazba, like our teacher is a Saiba Jazba, means that he, he, uh, 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 he didn't. He didn't rely upon explanation, scientific explanations. He relied upon devotional uh, orientation, spiritual orientation, and he used metaphors. He was our teacher. Even somebody said, "Oh, you know, it's a little bit like the mind's a little bit like a computer." And then he started using that metaphor. Does anybody remember this? Mm -hmm. No, am I right? So he would hear somebody use this expression. He would say, "Explain it to me." And then if he liked the metaphor, he would start using the metaphor, right? So he, he was not against these kind of things. So uh, in, in this one, though, we have to try to understand that the earth, uh, the important thing to understand is um, uh, uh, what is, um, 
what is it? What is it? The expression, the hadith, laulak, lama halatul al flock. What does that mean, uh, uh, Rahaf Chan? Do you know this expression? Laulak. Yeah. Uh, 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 la, uh, la, 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 yeah. What does that mean? Do you know this guy? Who is he speaking to? I will, I, will, I, will, I will not create anything because of you. Uh, it, it, if it was not for you, O Prophet Muhammad, yeah, Prophet Muhammad peace, be upon peace be upon him. If it was not for you, I would have not have created the falak ha. Laulak lama halaktul aflak. The the numerous skies. You see, if it was not for you, I would not have created those skies, meaning those seven heavens. Because we read in Quran, we will find these these idea of layered heavens. <coughs> so when we are looking at the the Ptolemaic universe, the the this is uh, Ptolemy is you know he's living prior he's living after the the time of the birth of Christ but prior to the time of Muhammad peace be upon him so and and prior to him uh, all that Ptolemy is doing is he's trying to make sense out of Aristotle's universe and and um, not Plato's Plato has a slightly different idea the thing I wanted you to understand, just as an example of that, is that, um, like, how do the Sufis make use of Ptolemy's universe? So Ptolemy has the, the earth over here, and he says, okay, um, we're going to put, we talked earlier, say, about Mars or Saturn, okay? So here's the, the sphere that, that they have. But even Ptolemy realizes there's, it's not working out because of, what were these funny things called earlier? Uh, the retrograde. So Ptolemy says, well, we can make it work if we put another circle here. So our little planet is going to be here, Saturn, and this, this is a, another little circle, and this planet is going around like this, and this is going around like this, and that will explain the retrograde. Because from here, we look here, and we can either see that the planet is it, it's here, or it's here, or it's here. And when it's going from here to here, it could appear to be backing up. It's not the truth. It's, it's, it's bad science. But it's the only thing that he could come up with that would mathematically make it work. Now he did that with every planet. So you have a you have the, the, the circle, you have what's called an epicycle, meaning a secondary circle, and that's how he resolved the problem. Now the Sufis like this because they said this was a whirling dervish, meaning Saturn is a whirling dervish. And Saturn is going like a whirling dervish around the the sun, you see, around the earth. But, but you have to understand that by the time we get to Ptolemy, um, Ptolemy is actually uh, a scientist. He's a, he's a mathematician, a cosmologist. And he realizes there's a problem with the system that Aristotle has left. And so he corrects it enough that it's used for hundreds and hundreds of years, all the way up into the 19th century, it's used. But the Muslims have already figured out that this is wrong. They figured out this is wrong by Biruni's time. But not, not everybody accepted that. So there were already theories that were debunking this. You see? And instead they were saying the other, the better way to explain this is that in fact this earth is moving around the sun. You see? And so, of course, in this view, if this is Saturn, the Earth is here, the Sun would be over here, huh? <coughs> the Sun is over here. And the better explanation is that the Earth is going around the Sun, and when it passes Saturn, you see, so we'll get rid of this epicycle, and we'll get rid of all of this, because this is not what's happening. See, what's really happening 
is that Saturn is also going around the Sun. See, both of these guys are going around the Sun. Saturn is out here going around the Sun. But when you, but when the Earth passes Saturn, the stars are behind it. And because they're so far away, they provide a backdrop. So momentarily, it appears that the, Earth, that the Saturn is moving backwards. It's a hallucination. And there are some Muslim scientists already wondering about, uh, they already also realize that these orbits are not pure circles, that they're elliptical, you see. So, so it's, and many of them do not. Like, I guess what I'm trying to say, it's, it's just like today. Like, how many people understand general relativity? Well, the general population sort of likes the idea, but they don't, they, we all understand it a little bit compared to the scientists. Scientists understand it profoundly. Uh, Zaki was in my navigation class, right? So no surprise that I'm interested in astrolabes and so forth because we, we find our way across the ocean. And what could be a better metaphor that you're on a sailboat in the middle of the ocean and you don't know where you are and the sky is going to tell you where you are. And you have a device which is a descendant from the astrolabe because you go from the astrolabe to the quadrant to the sextant. And not only Zaki, but his daughter, who was only what? How old was she? She's like 11 or something. His daughter was 11 years old, and she came and learned how to use the sextant, basically how to use the astrolabe. So what all I'm teaching is, a, is, is how to use a modern astrolabe, correct? Right. And, and uh, so the astrolabe, uh, the, the difference is that when we use the sextant, we actually like to use the language that we're looking at the stars and the skies, everything's moving east to west, uh, and, and, and they really are out there and they're moving around us because that experiential language is fine even though the mind knows that it's not like that. The mind knows that the earth is spinning creating day and night and the earth is tilted on its axis and it's going around the sun. But we're so lucky because in our culture there's an emphasis on knowledge and learning and so Amazingly, I was a little bit skeptical at first, but your daughter was able to learn and pass the test for the navigation. And so were you, and as I recall, uh, several other people were there, huh? Um, well, there, there's an intuitive component to that. It's, you know, you're, we, this, is, this is where we live, this is our habitat, and these uh, celestial bodies are part of that habitat, so we're just measuring. Yeah. Altitudes, and we're trying to determine geographical position, which is much like what you're describing. Yeah. Cosmologically, you know, where are you in this? Where are you placed right now? And this is all dependent on time. Yes, and then and then if you um, suddenly, uh, you see, because we have what what I like to refer to as the the mythical soul, in the good sense of that. And so uh, a person goes outside and, um, and, and can fall in love with the sky. A person can become a believer of God, in God by looking at the sky because it's so beautiful. So there's this mythical side that is outside of language and it's just the experience of being under the sky, the beautiful sky and the impression the sky makes. Now if you add an ocean and you can't, you don't know where you are, and you're lost, and you're on a journey, and the sky is also your friend, and it's going to show you the way and tell you where you are. Well, this is very lovely. So throughout the Masnavi and other Sufi books, we are going to see that God is has a world that is full of signs, and these signs are guiding people through the world, and. So in the case of the astrolabe, we're, we've recently, and we'll pretty much finish with this soon, of using these two examples, we'll call them of imperfect science. Two examples of imperfect science. One is an instrument called the astrolabe, and the other is a worldview called the Ptolemaic universe, including its epicycles, which, which create an explanation for retrograde planets, etc. 
uh, used, I'm afraid, even all the way to today by astrologers. They're still using the Ptolemaic model. And uh, But for the Sufis who knew uh, the more brilliant ones, including Ibn Arabi uh, and, and uh, even Shabastari arguably knows more than the commentator Lahiji does, because I believe that Shabastari is referring to the epicycles when he talks about circles that turn the other way. See, I believe he's aware of these epicycles that I just explained to you about. Uh, you can, you know, this is a, just if you're interested in this topic, you can pursue it on your own with books or, or even on um, uh, Wikipedia or something, huh? Uh, but we'll come back because we don't have a lot more time and we want to finish this particular section that we were on. And what it was about was uh, where we left off, as you'll recall, is we left off with the statement, uh, statement or two. Um, think was um, that um, Ziroke Chundel Barzachas Mione Rei Boshehodat Mushtamel Bar Ahkome Hardu Olamas Wa Ashro Ishtemol Bar Ahkome Shehodatas Fakat Pas Del Ash Azamboshat this is where we left off. He was talking about the the ash, which normally in the Quran is is about the throne, is it not? But you have statements where God uh, is is seated on His throne. You see, and so in this worldview, um, this crystalline sphere. So outside the sphere of the sun of the stars. So you look in the sky at night and you see the stars and they're all revolving around the earth is what it looks like. And then if you can recognize the planets, you realize they're not the same as the stars because they're moving in a, and the stars are not moving, meaning the relationship between the stars stays the same, but not with the planets. So you see this and you imagine a sphere for each one of those, including the moon. And a lot of what happened with the Ptolemaic view in terms of the positioning had to do with the speed of the objects, the apparent speed. The moon is going really fast. Mercury is going very fast. Venus is going very fast, but each one is going slower. The sun is going very fast, but not as fast as Venus which is not as fast as Mercury, which is not as fast as the Moon. So part of it, what the, the final analysis is they base it on the apparent speed of these, these rotations. And you go out from, as I said, from uh, Mars next, huh? the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and this gives you eight, huh? because you, then you have the stars, huh? Moon, Mercury, Venus. Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the sphere of the stars is eight. Number nine is the crystalline sphere. You see? Crystalline sphere. If you want, it could be number ten, because if you started counting the Earth, then it would be number ten. But just bear in mind, that to keep this in mind, so the Ash is there. Now for these people, they thought that's also where heaven is, because there are hadith that say that the, the, uh, this domain uh, of the crystalline sphere, it has an ash and it has a kursi. And as you recall from our conversations, what is the kursi? What does it mean? Footstool. Footstool. So if you were using 
a literalist image, which I know that we're sort of prohibited from doing, but on the other hand, they, clearly these names have a relationship to each other. Maybe that what I like is the way the Sufis say it is that, that uh, well, first of all, you know, Samawate wal ard, you know, you, a verse we all recite every day, I would think. Huh? So this is the, 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 the Kursi Ayata. So, so we know that the, uh, uh, his, his footstool, his Kursi, it encompasses, it, it encompasses the heavens and the earth. So we're talking about all these domains. So for that reason alone, the, the lower level of this crystalline sphere, or for some people there are two of these crystalline spheres, but let's just stick with Shabastari, is, is a kind of earth. It's an earth of paradise, and the sky of paradise would be the ash. You see, so that's how, how he's representing it. Now, some Sufis, they, they thought this was purely metaphorical, and some of them thought it was literal. You can tell from their writings. I, I think we can safely take it as metaphorical, based on our knowledge of the cosmos. But, but in terms of mythology and in terms of the heart and the relationship of the heart to the spiritual world, there's nothing wrong with this imagery, you see. So we're now coming to the next line in this, and that's why we need to know it. And he says, Magar, Magar del Marcase Arshibasitas que in chun nokta wan daure muhitas so this line I've translated as um, Is not the center of heaven's throne the heart, like a point round which the great sphere turns? And more literally, he's saying, um, um, yet the heart is the center of the simple throne. Simple meaning without stars, because uh, they mean by simple a good thing. They mean it's pure and simple, without any object in it, any knot, huh? like we were talking earlier, no knots tied to it. And he says, um, because this one, meaning the, the earth, or the heart, the heart, huh? because this is like a point, and the other is like the circumference around this point. Daure Muhita means a circumference in relationship to a point in mathematical terminology. His, his commentary says, Yani Guyo, Del en son, Markaze Ashibasit Wakeshoda, Ziroke in Del Hamchun, Hamchun Noktas, Wa on Ash. Dauri as muhite in nokta, wa basit onas ke murakab as ajzoye muhtalifae atobea naboshat, pas nis del enson bo ash, e pas nespate del enson bo ash, ke sovelhans o alfa mudabut, nespate markas boshat bo muhit. So he says, um, uh, it is said that the heart of the human being. Uh, is the very central point of the pure throne, which again is a sphere in this, in, is, is clearly we're being told to think of this through all of these lines we've read in the last two sessions, huh? is a crystalline sphere, inside is the stars, all those planets, the earth, huh? and on the earth you could say the earth is like, um, usually the earth is described as a nafs. And then the heart is a point. You see, so the heart is the thing living 
in this nafs, and it's the center of the universe, basically, is what he's saying. And uh, so he says, in other words, the the uh, it is said that the human heart, the heart of the human being, is the center of this this uh, crystalline sphere, because um, this this heart is just like a point in relationship to this uh, sphere, this this throne. Um, And uh, uh, and he says, and this and this throne is a is a sphere is a circle, um, which is the uh, uh, moving around is 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 drawn around this point, and basit uh, is that which is not compounded of parts of the various natural phenomena. It is not compounded. Murakab. Huh? Where do do we hear much of Murakab in Sufism? Does it come up as an idea? Huh? Like with Rumi, what does Murakab represent? Thoughts? Thank you. Uh, so Murakab with a cough, huh? Murakab. It it represents for him why we are prisoners. You see? Um you see, so he says, Boz has the Jehoni Hesorain Tang Tarbuk is in Donistan. You see? Elati Tang East Tarkibo Adat Tarkib Tarkibo Adat Johnebe Tarkib His Homi Kashat Zonsui His Olami Tauhi Don so he always, for the Sufis, the minute you, you read this word, Tarki, uh, Murakab, you understand that you are, that it has to do with the limitations of the pluralistic world of multiplicity, that, that the entrapment of multiplicity and they, it is in, they're entrapped, uh, the people are entrapped because of the senses, specifically. Uh, this is a very Platonic idea, and uh, this is also a Greek idea. But it happens to be in the Quran. It happens to also be in the Quran. So it's not just a Greek idea. It happens to be an idea that might be based on observation. And it will show up in the Quran, it will show up in the Mahayana texts, it will show up in a lot of places, you see. So this idea of compoundedness, that there are aggregates that create blindness, you see, so for, So that's why when he says, now you can see the journey. So when you look at some of the people who used Ibn Sina's tale of the birds, the birds for them are flying through these spheres, not, not across mountains. They're flying through these spheres. Our friend Rahmat John is trying to fly through these spheres, and somebody's saying, no, 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 bosh, 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 you see. But we want to fly through these spheres, fly away, right? Because he's saying this sphere up there is not Moraka. And, and this sphere for Rumi, the, the opposite of Moraka is also called Rahman. I can demonstrate that to you in his poetry. So for Rumi, the the returning to the mercy meanings means to become denuded, to become naked of what is compounded. If you can become naked of that, if you can become unconscious of that, you will return to the mercy and you will return to the unity simultaneously. And Rumi brings this up in a poem where he admits he is still given to uncontrollable anger. We, we can, I've read this to you before, I can read it to you, but in the, same, in the same passage where he's explaining that he's still given to rage and anger, like maybe Hazrat Ali when somebody spits in his face, huh? Uh, and, and how he's explaining there's a world beyond that, beyond emotion, beyond the 
the attachments that would create such rage, attachments based in the senses and the addictions of the senses and their effect on the emotions, you see. So it's not a surprise that, that Lahiji here is stressing this point. Now coming back to his point, he's saying that in Basit is that which does not have the compoundedness of the particulars the, or the, the diverse parts of, of the uh, natural elements, you see. And he says, therefore, the relationship of the heart of the true human being to the throne, which had been previously been asked about, is a relationship of the central point to its circumference. So now we have the idea, a very common idea of the Sufis, that there's the point and then the compass that goes around it, whether it's the point of existence, or in this case, the point of these spheres. Then he says, um, okay, so uh, let's see, how's our time here? Yeah, we're okay for a little bit, but, I'm, but I'll have to move a little bit on this, okay? So, Bedam ke harakate ash ke falake azamas wa majmoe harakot badu mufayazas wa az davoyere aflok doere ojerinas dauri as wa harakate kalbe ensoni dar nafs markazas wa unjo Ahrahmanu alo ashe astawa. So now he's quoting a Quranic verse here, huh? Wa inja kolube kolube ubad baine asbain men asbay rahman ke du esbay jalal wa jamalas. و به ضرورت حرکت دوری تا به حرکت مرکز است پس حرکت اش تا به حرکت دل باشد very interesting stuff so he says you should know that the movement of the great uh, crystalline throne uh, which is the greatest throne the greatest sky or, or the greatest sphere uh, and all of the, the aggregate of the other movements of the other spheres uh, are in its care, are entrusted to it. And, and from the rotation of the various spheres, um, it is the outermost, the last of the spheres. And the movement of the heart of the human being in the self is its center and and uh, regarding it meaning that sphere he says the the merciful has, is established huh, uh, on this sphere and for this one meaning the heart there is the hadith which is the hearts of the true worshippers are bind are, are between the two fingers of the fingers of the merciful. You see, so he's quoting a, another hadith there. Um, and these are the two fingers of um, majesty and beauty. Um, and therefore, of necessity, uh, the movement and the rotation of a circle is around its center, and there, and thus, the movement of the throne is tied to the the turning of the heart of the human being. Okay, uh, and then lastly, for tonight, let's see if we have time. Well, let's see. Maybe we should stop there and take any any. Uh, Better that we take a few minutes to see if there's questions or or um, comments about this. Does anybody have a question about this? Um, 
these ideas, this doctrine. Is it clear? Yes. It's it's a question that may we may want to put off to another time, but I was wondering earlier if there's an easy way to describe the correspondence between this these spheres, you know, from the crystalline inward and the spheres that we've come to know about Lahut and Malakut and Naswut. Yeah, well, again, you have um, a, a comfort in the mythical heart. See, we should always honor um, we have many faculties, which is why we are the human being and which is what God loves about us because uh, we have the capacity to love, and God, God loves the angels, but they are not able to love Him. And God loves the human in particular, and especially, for example, because the human is able to love Him. Now, what's so interesting to me is to look at God's language in, uh, whether it's Hadith Qudsi or in the Qur'an, and again, um, we should distinguish in the Quran between, let's say, the language of civilization or the language of um, of regulation versus the language of divine self-disclosure, where he God's revealing Himself. So we were here when when uh, our friends, uh, uh, Kabir and Kamil, were here recently. We were talking, somebody was asking about the place of knowledge, and, and I said, well, there's a direct relationship to love, because when, when God said I was a hidden treasure and I love to be known, uh, love came first, you see. So he could have said, I was a hidden treasure and I know about love. He could have said a lot of things, but the way the sentence is organized, you see, it's very specific language and so many places including these hadiths which were quoted tonight for God to say um, that he has a ash and a kursi and he has fingers but we should take this as we found out uh, from Abu Hanifa how does he say we should take this without uh, trying to really understand how. See, it's a very interesting thing, the doctrine of Belakaifa, because it, it is what has caused wars. Wars have erupted over this. And in fact, today, arguably, you could say some of these same wars are, are erupting. But what if the God uses this language because on the one hand, he's speaking to the intellect, and on the other hand, he's speaking to the mythical heart. And in the mythical heart, he knows that uh, Hafez says to imagination, for example, he says, I will bar your road. Because see, the mullahs say you have to bar the road of imagination. So Hafez, he's making fun of that. And he says, I will block your road. And she says, ah, but I will come from some other direction. She so has poems about how you cannot block the imagination. Now, a lot of the imagination could just be neurotic, but I'm talking not about the neurotic imagination. I'm talking about the mythical ability of the human being. And frankly, you're more likely to escape the earth on a burak than, than in a rocket ship, you see, because the burak has no limitation. It's, it's the mythical part of the human being is traveling on a burak. A burak is a strange creature that, that is deliberately not supposed to be like any of the creatures of the earth. And in fact, as you're talking about these levels, it stands between these levels. So uh, what I'm getting at is the human being is very comfortable and sometimes uh, in danger because of its mythical understanding of hierarchies, uh, even, even ideas of color. Like, like light is better than darkness, uh, can easily become white people are better than black people. See, the problem with imagination, the problem with the way the mind works. On the other hand, 
the correct way is that one one surrenders like Moses did to the burning bush and his mythical imagination saw a paradox. What was the paradox? What was the paradox? We're speaking. It was what? Speaking. That's, well, one thing is it was speaking, that certainly is a, a quandary to understand if nothing else, but there was actually a, a natural paradox, which is what? As it, it becomes greener as it burns? It becomes greener as it's burning. Okay. Now, now think about that for a minute. Think of, that's the description, the exact description. Uh, would you agree it's a paradox? Yeah. And it, isn't, it, isn't it supposed to silence the intellect? May not, there's also the removing the shoes part, which seems important too. There's there's all kinds of yeah. things, but when he when he arrives, I'm talking about an actual paradox where where it's impossible. I Meaning removing the shoes is possible. Yeah. Uh, for God to be speaking uh, is 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 sacred, but before God speaks, what he sees is something that is literally impossible. It's, it's a, it, it, it defies any understanding of the intellect. And it prepares the intellect for something even more impossible that this same bush says, Ini an Allah, truly I am God, you see. And now, if you happen to be in, in, um, in the world at that time, and you were with some very conservative people, and if you did that today, and you said, "Hey, this um, uh, this doorpost over here told me it was God," they might throw you to an insane asylum, or beat you up, or cut your throat, or whatever they're going to do. And when when Halaj said, uh, "I am God," they they did a lot worse to him, didn't they? So, my my point is that the 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 usefulness of these models, let's call them models, <coughs> is that they, they, we should use them in their own domain. Now one domain is intellectual, and I gave you an object is an intellectual uh, overlay. And, and the main thing is, it's like a, a, uh, a stirrup uh, on the burak. You see, in other words, you, you, it's, to make the burak work, it has a lot of, it, it fits the saddle, fits the person, and the person has uh, several um, modalities of understanding operated, operating simultaneously. Uh, if you're in the dream at night, you, you will not be able to challenge the impossible, will you? You actually are in the dream and you fully believe that what's, what's going on there, no matter how impossible it is, you may question it, but usually you're going to believe it anyway because you are now in a different modality of understanding. So in Sufism, they're trying to harness the different faculties of the human being. So you have a chariot, now we're back to Hinduism, there's a chariot, and there's a charioteer, and there are horses. And the horses must not go wherever they want to. So the horses are gonna pull the chariot. And the charioteer must also have control over how fast and they know the chariot. You see, so these ideas about different faculties, the senses, the imagination. Now, now, coming to your point, is there are these, these layers. Yes, they are very much related in the sense that they are hierarchical. They, they, they bring us to Lahut. And what relationship does Lahut have to the mercy? I think it would have a more transparent relationship. It's more. Is it is it the same as the mercy? I would I would think so, but I don't. I can't yeah, I would think so because, yeah. for example, if we think about Hahut, yeah. uh, there's not a whole lot we could know about it, is there? Right. And God tells us that. You know, I am, I am, uh, you know, Ranyal al I am, I'm independent of the worlds on the one hand. Uh, and, and he has a name of his essence, says, I am Allah. And on the one hand, I am independent of the worlds. 
But if you are if you are standing on the side underneath, looking at this interface, uh, I am not independent of the worlds. Mm. Uh, you can call me Allah, or you can call me what? Rahman. Yeah. Clearly, Lahud is is equivalent to the Rahman from that point of view. Mm. Um, we are from there. So if we look at the Ensan, the Ensan is derived from Lahut. <coughs> so now, think about how wonderful this is. Um, if we take that example, because you're saying, are these equivalent? Mm -hmm. Well, now we're going to say there's a very interesting situation um, where you have, um, in the case of Shabastari's model, there's an, there's an outer Rahman called the Ash. And, and we find out that who is it in this hadith who is sitting on the Ash? The one that I read earlier, it's the Rahman. It doesn't say Allah is sitting on the, on the Ash. It's saying the Rahman is sitting on the Ash. Or is established, I should say, on the Ash, right? So, so now we, we realize that if we were in a position that if we wanted to, would it be useful to, it wouldn't hurt. We'd say, well, we would position this at Lahut. But interestingly enough, um, when God says to the clay of Adam, you see, when he says, um, according to the school of love, he actually says it, he says how sad he is, because he says, um, Oh, you who believe, those of you who turn away from your faith. He doesn't say we'll fry you alive or anything that these fanatics want to do. He says we will bring another people. Whom God loves, and they love him. Isn't that what he says? So this is in Nasut he's talking about. And, and, and Shabastari is saying that you have these spheres, and he says, oh, we love this metaphor. You have the spherical world that's like an onion with spheres, and in the middle there's like this, this, it, there's this almost like a, you know, a rope that you spin around, and it has these beads on it, and as you spin them around, you have these different planets, you see. And in the middle is the human being, and, 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 I, and I gave the uh, laulok, huh? if it were not for you, for thou, Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him. I would not have created these heavens, aflok, falak, and aflok, aflok is the plural of falak. Huh? I would not have created these other heavens if it was not for you. Why for him? Because he is a comprehensive uh, mirror or the comprehensive locus for all of the divine names, according to the Sufi point of view. Agreed? And uh, or uh, we did last time. Wala yas ani ardi wala samoi. Lakin lakin yas ani kalbe abdul mumin. You see, and my my uh, earth and my heavens they do not encompass me. They do not contain me. But the heart of my servant, the faithful. Now that one would be very close to what Shabastari is saying, is it not? Yeah. So we would, we would see that the, the heart of the human suffuses the whole universe. And all of Lahiji's position and all of the Sufis by this time, after Ibn Arabi, they, they have to do with the idea that, that the, the universe and everything we see in it is, um, is tafsil, meaning the full deployment in detail, and the ensan is ejmal. Ejmal means uh, completely joined and, and, and in potentia. And in fact, everything in the universe comes from the human being. So there's a very uh, shocking view, you know, that was not just in Islamic culture, but is certainly very well represented in Islamic culture. And it sounds just so far out, you see, that the whole universe is modeled on human consciousness, we could say. And you only see it um, 
Just as Muhammad, peace be upon him, comes as the last prophet, the whole universe is created and it evolves, and finally it evolves to where there's a creature who is, in fact, where it came from. What is that like? They say it is like planting a seed, and it grows into a tree, and there are fruit, and in those fruit, there's another one of those seeds. And you can plant that seed, and it will grow into a tree, and it has fruit, and within it is a seed. And you could say that for thousands and millions of years, and this would be, of course, the the Indian, meaning the Hindu notion of these kalpas and these cycles that are coming and destroying again and again and again, and very much like some of modern physics, actually, uh, of universes and, yeah. and, and so on. We don't know about that. What we should know about is what's practical, which is how can the heart um, become transformed? How will we know it's transformed? Using modern science, we could say that if the heart it becomes vastly expanded to where when you look out at the universe, you realize it is not as expansive as the heart. Like Bayezid said, it could, you could fit it in the corner of the heart and the heart would still be thirsty for this expansion because God is in limitless expansion. So if the heart should suddenly become aware of God, uh, the, 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 this is about experience. This is not a philosophy. So any model that will help us to get there would be worthwhile. And this model that, that we've read about tonight, uh, as I say, we won't pursue it much more than this. But, um, meaning I, I don't want to, I'm happy to pursue it to the extent that there are questions about it, but I've given two examples of the scientific knowledge of its time, both which are regarded by today's science as flawed. Um, yet both serve as adequate uh, and useful models for spiritual development. Uh, one is an instrument, the astrolabe, and, and, um, and the other is a cosmological model which, which uh, by its very nature was flawed so flawed that they had to invent all kinds of devices to make it work. It did work, however. You could use the Ptolemaic model to predict when planets would show up and when events, celestial events would occur. That's why it was used all the way until the 19th century and is used all the way to today by astrologers. Uh, however, it also shows us how flexible Muslim thinking was and how they were willing to use not just these metaphors, but countless metaphors. Rumi has dozens of them that we could look at. But, but these particular ones we've, we've talked about for the last few sessions. And I, I merely want to, to show you that they are useful because if you uh, forget about TV, forget about wasting time, um, if you want to tell stories, tell stories that will return you to your beloved. If you get stuck at some, some uh, quagmire where the story doesn't bring you back to your purpose, you better escape from that to find stories that will take you back to your homeland. Right? So these are all stories that will bring us back to the homeland and, and, and to that extent that we, we should read them, we should understand them. And when we read the Quran, we, we should let it teach us. Um, in my judgment, the contemporary understanding of the Quran, I mean today, not of the people like Rumi and others, I'm talking about what people say today, I can't imagine it being more ignorant than it is today. I cannot imagine it being more foolish, stuck, backwards, irrelevant than it has become today. So what I'm trying to do is show how flexible uh, the Quran was to the people of earlier times and how they, they used it as buraks to rise up to God. They didn't let other people tell them how to swallow their own food. They learned 
from their mother, meaning from the true source, how to swallow, and then they ate and they swallowed on their own. So this is what we want to try to understand. We want to bring the history of Islam directly into recollection, with examples, with, with a broad understanding of what they're trying to say. That's why we spend maybe an inordinate amount of time looking at these metaphors. But we can look at a lot of them, they're all very interesting to me. Because they show us a very different understanding of the Quran, of Islam, the purpose of worship, etc.